Welcome to Love and Lordship Live. I'm your host, Greg Williams, and I want to thank all of you for your replies and your shares and your likes and those who are reaching out to support us, prayers and financially. Such a big encouragement to me and to the ministry and the message. And so I want to thank you again for that. Last week, we discussed real authority as defined and modeled by the author. Thank you for your replies and comments again. And over the next several weeks, we're going to enter into a series on the holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And we're going to do that leading up to each one of those. And I want to ask you, what does Thanksgiving look like or mean to you? What does it conjure up as far as memories are concerned? This week our topic is simply Thanksgiving, a day or a lifestyle? You know, Thanksgiving was never meant to be shut up in a single day. That is from author Robert Kaspar. And, and i got to tell you, I, I'm all for Thanksgiving and the holidays and Christmas. And i got to make full disclosure here. I am a Thanksgiving and Christmas junkie. Okay? I'm a, I'm a freakaholic, whatever you want to call it. I love everything about them. Family, food, football, basketball, fun. And above all else, the reminders of all of this that points to our Heavenly Father and His Son Jesus and His Holy Spirit. We have so much to be thankful for. I put up my lights for the holidays the first or second weekend of November, okay? And I don't take them down until usually mid-January. I know some people do more than that, but I usually try and seek them out and pull their lights down so I get mine up first. No, I'm really kidding. I don't do that. So I'm glad most of you don't know exactly where I live. But anyway, I love to see the lights and all the reminders of Thanksgiving and Christmas as they go up. Because if we'll stop and think about it every time we see one, we can have that memory. And I know that not, not all of them are pleasant, but that doesn't change Thanksgiving. And that's what I hope you get over the next three weeks and on into Christmas. That regardless of what we're facing, we still have so much to be thankful for. And Christmas is actually where it begins. You see... I know that some of the purists out there will be going, I can't believe he's mixing Thanksgiving and Christmas together. And you'll be down on me already, but don't turn it off. There's a lot here that we can, that we can learn from each other. And the fact that we live in a free country means that I can put my lights up whenever I want to. And I can take them down whenever I want to, right? And you can do the same. But here's the beautiful part. If it weren't for Thanksgiving we would miss out on the great opportunity to give thanks to the one who makes it all happen. And if it weren't for Christmas, most of my thanksgiving would be void. It would be empty. That's why I love to do them together, and I certainly appreciate those who single them out and do it. But Christmas makes thanksgiving that much better for me, and thanksgiving makes Christmas that much better for me because they're all tied up in the one who's given me everything. So I want to give him thanks. It really is because of Christ that we have all things, and we should continually be offering thanks to him. Hebrews 13, 15, and 16 speaks about that, and I'll wrap up today with a quote from that verse. So I want you to keep that in mind. You can even look it up now while we're going through this teaching. Hebrews 13, 15, and 16. You see, my parents and my family had a lot to do with my love for the holidays. It wasn't until I was in probably my late teens or early 20s that I began to realize that the holidays could bring a lot of tough and painful memories. That it could bring frustration and angst and anxiety. And that just begins to take away from all the wonderful things that we could enjoy. For some, like me, I see the others would call the fairy tale holiday and choose to do so even in the midst of my own trials and pain. For others, the songs and the movies, the, 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 I should say this, the songs and the movie versions of it are really just a pipe dream. Is the joy, the peace, and the love in the songs and the movies real? Or is it just cultural marketing to make a buck? Well, let, let's take a look back at the history of Thanksgiving and really try and capture what it really is. Is it just a day of fun and festivities? Food? Lots of food. Okay. Uh, bowl games, those kind of things, or is there more? I'm going to give you a brief history today, and the, the, the goal in this 
is to have us, as we look back and bring it all the way up to modern day, look at the thread that runs through all of this that truly is thanksgiving. There's a reason for it. All the way from the Israelites, God's people, to the pilgrims, to the founding of our country, to modern day. Old Testament examples are, are rampant throughout. If you if you'll go on to the website, loveandworship.com, you'll see the article of this, and I have them all linked so you can go and look at the various scriptures in the Old Testament where the Israelites were constantly giving sacrifices and offerings simply of thanksgiving for what God had done for them and what he'd given them. Over and over again, they take time out of their, their schedules, just like you and I have to do. But they didn't just do it one day. They did it throughout the year. They would stop and have a day or some time of thanksgiving and feast and offering up their thanks, giving their thanks to God. Well, you say, that's the Old Testament. Yeah, well, it continued in the New Testament, and it's summed up in two scriptures in particular. Philippians 4, 4 through 7 literally says this, that, that we should rejoice always. And, he, and Paul says, I'll say it again, rejoice with everything. And in thanksgiving in all things, make your prayers and your petitions known to the Lord. And the God of all mercy will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus with the peace that passes understanding. Why wouldn't we want to give thanks for that? He says, in all things, I can sum Philippians 4, 4 through 7 up in this simple phrase, rejoice and give thanks in all circumstances. And God will give you that peace. You see, it's us understanding that there is something to be thankful for and that he is in our lives and that he does make his peace present and evident in our lives, even when we're struggling. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says it this way. Rejoice always, give thanks in everything, and pray without ceasing, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let me say that again, because it's pretty simple. Rejoice always, give thanks in everything. Don't miss that word. Give thanks in everything and pray without ceasing for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So sum that up. We give, we, we give our thanks to God at all times in every circumstance, just like Philippians 4 talked about. All the time, no matter what. So fast forward then to the new world, as we called it, when Columbus Pilgrims all came over. In October of 1621, they had what we commonly thought of or talk about or labeled or titled the first Thanksgiving. There were 90 Native Americans there. There were approximately 50 pilgrims, half of the original 100 that had come over on the Mayflower. The rest of them had died during that very harsh winter. What did they have to give thanks for? Their loved ones, their spouses, their children, their parents and grandparents had died, half of them. Yet they took time out with the Native Americans to have a feast. And it actually wasn't one day, it was a three-day feast. That's documented by, I can't remember his name right now, I should have it, but I have it in the article. Okay, so go check that out. A three-day feast lasted for three days of food and fun. And don't miss this, prayer. Giving thanks to God. So now we have the Israelites, we have the New Testament church, we have the pilgrims who came from the old world to the new world. What's the common thread? Giving thanks. Giving it to who? Giving thanks to God. Move forward, even before, and before I move forward, let me say this. That the New England colonists that came over from the old world, it wasn't the first Thanksgiving. They were actually accustomed to regularly celebrating thanksgivings. So their days of prayer, thanking God for blessings and for following the examples of God's people found in Scripture that we just talked about, the people of Israel, those in the church, in the early church, they were just following that example. So when they had a three-day feast in 1621, October of 1621, with the Native Americans, they were just doing what they'd always done. It was just a continuance of thanksgiving, which is exactly what God's Word says we ought to do. Now, fast forward to me to fast forward with me to the the beginning of our country, 
the Declaration of, Pen of Independence and the Constitution. And we find this said by our founding father and our first president, George Washington. Let me just read it to you. It is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to him implore His protection and favors. That was our first president's Thanksgiving proclamation on October 3rd, 1789. About 84 years later, the 16th president of the United States, President Abraham Lincoln, in the middle of the Civil War, our country's darkest time. I'm just going to give you some of the key quotes. Again, you'll find his, almost his entire proclamation in the article entitled Thanksgiving Part 1 on the, on the website when you go to it. The year that is drawing toward its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties, which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from where they came, others have been added, which are so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever-watchful providence of Almighty God. In the midst of a civil war of unequal magnitude and severity, he goes on to say, No human counsel has devised nor has any mortal hand worked out these great things that God has given us. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who while dealing with us in anger for our sins, has nevertheless remembered mercy. And I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble penitence for our national perverseness and disobedience commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged and fervently implore the interposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of this nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. It is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all of history, which is what we just talked about, that those nations are blessed whose God is the Lord. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven, we have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved in us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our own hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. And as he closed, he said this, It has seemed to me fit and proper that God should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwells in the heavens. Abraham Lincoln, Thanksgiving Proclamation, October 3rd, 1863. One final reminder of our country's history with thanksgiving to God Almighty. Almost exactly 100 years after Lincoln's official proclamation for thanksgiving, President John F. Kennedy issued his proclamation, number 3560, on November 5th, 1963, stating, over three centuries ago, our forefathers in Virginia and in Massachusetts, far from home, in a lonely wilderness, 
set aside a time of thanksgiving. On the appointed day, they gave reverent thanks for their safety, and we know now it was three days, <laughs> for the health of their children, for the fertility of their fields, for the love which bound them together, and for the faith which united them with their God. Our country is in a faith crisis. Defining God in our own image, promoting sexual immorality through media, education, and government, and even in some of our churches, denying the religious freedoms without which any and every nation eventually crumbles. But we have so much to be thankful for. So let us give thanks to God for all he has blessed us with, seen us through, and prepared us for. Our prayer at Love and Lordship is that we as individuals, as families, as Christ Church, would remind those in our spheres of influence and be an example to our country of what his love, grace, and mercy are. As we offer, this is the Hebrews 13 scripture I was talking about, Hebrews 13, 15. As we offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, which is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. We're here to help you live joyfully and have fulfilling lives and relationships in the love and worship of Jesus Christ. There is no charge for the conversations, the counseling, and the mentoring that we provide. If you have a need or feel like you're all alone and nowhere else to turn, please email me. Give us a call. We're here to help. Thank you. Have a great day. And God bless. We hope you've been encouraged, challenged, and blessed by today's message from Greg and Love and Lordship. Join us again next week as Greg shares more about the love and lordship of Jesus.